Hello, welcome to another edition of the Football History Podcast. Joining me, Nick Hart, here today to discuss a record-breaking goal scorer for club and country, as well as being an innovative coach who worked on three continents, a theatre circus co-star of Charlie Chaplin and an escapee from World War I Germany. And as the uh, the book says, of the first working-class hero, who is author, Mark Metcalf, welcome back to the show, Mark. Good to have you back on the show again, mate. Thank you very much. I'm very pleased to to be here and I'm pleased to see that in Millwall, one of my favourite teams are, are doing well. So, yeah. Thing, fingers fingers con- crossed, well, fingers crossed. Yeah, long may that continue. <laughs> We're talking, listeners, of course, about Fred Spikesley. Um, and Mark is the author of a, of, a, of a great book, a remarkable story of Fred Spikesley, the first working class football hero. Um, which is available via www.penandsword.co.uk. I will stick a link on the social media for this show. Um, Mark, I mean, a remarkable early footballer. I mean, I, I, I don't know that words can quite do the man <laughs> justice. Genius no, and, no. and, like all artists, a flawed genius in some ways. I it might be the best nut shoulder I can come up with. How do you see him? Well, um what Spikesy managed to do during his life was to pack two or three lives in, into one. <laughs> a good way uh, to put it. That's yeah. the truth of the matter. But uh, it's about a decade ago when I, I bumped into uh, one of his relatives' uh, descendants, uh, Clive Nicholson. Yeah. And uh, at the time, his dad was struggling to do uh, the book on uh, on Fred. And then they asked me to do it and. Uh, we initially produced it as a, a hardback, uh, and when when we brought that out, I think it's true to say the Sheffield Wednesday fans, for whom he was arguably their greatest footballer, had hardly heard of him. Uh, the is, however, a, a plaque in Sheffield which bears his name to the great side of uh, 1896, which became the first Yorkshire side to win. The FA Cup, right? Uh, despite that, the Sheffield Wednesday fans, most people when speaking to them, looked at you with amusement as to who was Fred Spikesley. Uh, I mean, it's a BBC article which actually kind of touches on that. I think they describe him. I'm speaking from memory, uh, uh, listeners, but yeah. they describe him as the, the the greatest footballer you've never heard of, which I think is actually is it's, it's a nice epitaph, but it's it's kind of a sad one given the range. Of his talents, Mark, and yeah, and the life not, that he it's led. Not, it's also it's also now not true, uh, because the truth of the matter is the hardback that came out, um, we it was for varying reasons we self published it. Mm. I and mean, we sold a thousand copies in the first four weeks, so there was clearly clearly a demand. Yeah, the story that was being told hit a strong nerve. Yeah, I can't imagine it has ever been a book about a footballer from the Victorian era, which has sold a thousand copies of a hardback book at £20 a piece at the time in four weeks. But once no, people no. started to hear the story, they were completely taken in by it. By the time we ended up, we got sick of uh, doing the hardbacks. Um, we thought that by that period of time that we'd sold at least one book to a supporter of every single club in the Premier League and in the Football League. Right. We even sold, we estimate, around 60 to Sheffield United fans because, of course, it tells the story not only of Spikesley, but it tells the story of football in that initial <laughs> movement away from the amateur game yeah. to the professional game. And that's what we wanted to, to do Within t- with telling Fred Spikesley's story, we wanted to say this is how the game moved from being amateur. You well to do amateurs who didn't need to be paid to play the game into working class communities and to giving an opportunity. Admittedly, it's to smallish numbers of working class people the opportunity not to work in grimy factories, down the pit, at the shipyards, 
there's nothing wrong with those jobs. No. I was a semi-skilled machine operator myself um, it, before, you know, uh, leaving that job in my mid twenties. Um, and but you know, lots of working class lads and lasses now, of course, uh, want to play football to get out of those experiences and to Absolutely. be able to enjoy a, a great life playing a game which more than anything is is the biggest sporting game on the on in the world okay and what spikes they did is he went out to see that world and so after being a great footballer in this country he went out to manage in sweden where he became a great coach he went to france he went to belgium he went to germany yeah he was uh, imprisoned at the beginning of the first world war he performed a a trick which managed to get him out. Remarkable of, trick uh, as well. well. To get home. Yeah, yeah. Uh, he 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 went then later on to manage in in America where he, he won both of the major trophies at that time. He went out to Mexico where he won the trophies with with, with a, one of the best teams uh, down down there. He came home. He briefly coached at Fulham. He went back to Germany. And he was the last English coach to win the German title, which he did with Nuremberg. And uh, in the 19, 1920s, he came mm. home, he coached young people. There'll be some of your listeners will have the old cigarette cards of famous teams from the 1930s and before then. There was only one which wasn't of a famous team or of a famous player. And that was at the school where Spikesley was the coach. So that gives you some idea that this was a man of some standing. And so just with those tales alone, um, he um, he became he became famous in his own right, in his own in his own periods of time. And one of the new one of the things we've developed in the new uh, paperback book was of Spikesley's time in Spain where he managed Badalona, which is a small team in Barcelona. And during the time that Spikes, he was the coach there. Let's not forget, he was in his 60s by now. Yeah. He was still innovative. innovative. He had made in 1929 the first speaking uh, training uh, manual for uh, aimed at young people. You can see some of that still. Uh, it's called uh, The Great Fred Spikesley. And you can see there's 84 seconds of that left. Uh, Pathé News did that. It was clearly not the only one that he made. He was brave enough at that time to be highly critical of the man who's rated in the top five, let's say in the top two or three greatest mm. English managers, Herbert Chapman. He criticised Herbert Chapman. He criticised the FA. He said that the skills that they were teaching young people were not sufficient in an era where continental teams, continental coaches were catching up and were overtaking English football. That's he believed in um, he believed in technique, Mark. I think it's probably the best way. Ball, ball control and ball technique. He did indeed. He was very, very, very strong on that. At the same time, what he did when he went to Spain, which we 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 discovered. Uh, since we did the hardback to the softback, mm. is that Spikesley started to invent the idea of putting sticks in the ground, which is basically an obstacle which players had to go around or pass the ball. It was him that developed the sticks, the cones, the ideas for other means of uh, basically when people go to work to play football, what the, the, the trick at that time was still in many places not to give the players the ball. This was something which happened until the 1960s. I've heard of this. The idea, <laughs> the idea, yeah, the idea being that players would therefore be desperately in need of the ball when they played it on a on a on a Saturday. That's that's a real thing. I've read that in um, Eamon Dunphy's uh, bio, uh, year, year diary. Brilliant book. But that that's very point. Book of not giving the ball, the ball to players because then they would be hungry for it in the course of the game. I mean, it's yes. it sounds so ridiculous in the it modern sense. 
And it I mean, really Dunphy, good. again, another brave, brave man, um, controversial, called that out as as did Fred back in his time. It was um, going against the flow, wasn't it, Mark? Yeah, Dunphy's uh, book uh, is absolutely brilliant. If there's by any chance none of your listeners haven't got that book, that and Harry Gregg's book yeah. are amongst my two favourite football books. They are absolute joys to read. And they give a, a much greater understanding of what it's like to be a professional uh, f- footballer. Uh, and yeah, I mean, they, they've, they've everybody should have those two football books uh, on on their shelves. But it's interesting. Years. Yeah, it's interesting that you would criticise a name like Herbert Chapman, Mark, who is revered, yes. almost god godlike status in the game, isn't yes. it? Even to this yes. day, you know. Yes, and, he, and he, in, in a way. He could only have done that because he was super confident about his beliefs. It yeah. didn't stop Herbert Chapman, to his credit, putting Spikesley in his all-time greatest team. Oh, fair play. Now, considering, yeah. Yeah, yeah. considering Arsenal had Alex James, yeah. who's rated as one of their greatest ever footballers, that is some that is some you know tribute that he picked him. In his greatest, in his greatest side. No, I, I imagine Spikesley also. I mean, we've already said flawed genius. We'll come on to his oh, football footballing many, career and many, many flaws. flaws. Um, but I would imagine rather like the geniuses in other sports we've seen since. You know that there's a you you, you pay the price for brilliance with um, behaviour. Sometimes it isn't isn't so great in other ways. That's but true. Pe- that's people true. indulge that mark, don't they? And I think maybe that's I Herbert mean, Chapman's yes. view there. You know, um, I, I, I mean, I mean, obviously, when we're talking great wingers in English football, you you have to look at uh, George at George Best. Best, I mean, yeah. Best was was you know brilliant. Yeah. Uh, and it's interesting uh, that co- that we do have some comments from Sheffield Wednesday fans who are now long dead, which we didn't include in the book, where they. St- they had seen Spikesley and best play right. 60, 70 years between and made wow. comparisons wow. between the between the two of them. Two greats. The yeah. nearest comparison which can be made is in terms of goals scored. Spikesley's and best records, goals per game. Okay. This is in the top flight of English football, are comparable. Yep. In fact, Spikesley probably just beats George Best. Uh, in 1896, in 1897-98, Spikesy became the first winger to finish in the top two goal scorers in the top flight of English football. He well, he began his um, it's what a stat that struck me, Mark. He began his career in, in Gainsborough. He's a native of Gainsborough in in, in, yes. in Lincolnshire, and I, 126 appearances for Gainsborough Trinity, 131 goals yes, from 126 yes. appearances. Now, whatever your level, yes, yes that's name me a level where a goal a game plus is <laughs> is achievable. Yes. It's it's incredible. Yes, and his record his record for Sheffield Wednesday in the top flight. Yeah, he's still the third top scorer in the history of Sheffield has history of Sheffield Wednesday, and that gives you some i some idea. So he finished second in the in the in the top scorers in 1897-98, the next time, this was an era where the ball was largely to be given to the centre forward to score the goals. Okay. Yeah. The next time a winger finishes in the top two, admittedly top, was 1967-68, George Best, who finished level top with Ron Davies of Southampton. There is a little bit of an aside to that, is that that was the season when Dennis Law was injured towards the end of that season. Right. Okay. Best yeah. played many of the games at inside forward. Right. That's not to take away the fact that he was obviously a great goal scorer, but in general, best goal scoring record was just not quite at the record of Fred Spikesley. And there are there'll be football fans I'm saying on here they'll be saying, well, there wasn't many people at these games and that yeah. sort of things. Yeah. That would be in a, that would be inaccurate. Certainly, the gates hadn't ridden, risen to what Manchester United were getting in the 1960s. But regular gates are 20, 25,000. The cup final was 48,000. England, Scotland, 
became record numbers when Spikes he played in 1898 at 62,000. So we are talking gates comparable to perhaps what Arsenal might be getting at this particular period of time in the big matches. And yeah. gates similar to what my own team would be getting 30,000 Sunderland at this mm. at this current current period current period of time. So there were plenty of people going to these, these these football matches, and they were the what was happening was that what was happening at the football was dominating increasingly working class communities. The fervor, the atmosphere, the pitches, particularly at the big games, the FA Cup matches, and it was in that in particular that Spike Lee became a great star. He, he firstly he overturned uh, when Sheffield Wednesday were losing to Derby County in 1893. He produced some a memorable game against Aston Villa. And then in 1896, he was the supreme star of that season, culminating in him scoring the quickest goal in the FA Cup final in a matter of a few seconds. It's not recognised as, as, no. as such to be that. And he Pretty much from kickoff, goal. I guess. Yeah. And he's yeah. got he scored the winning goal, a dramatic shot from many, many yards out to beat Wolverhampton Wanderers uh, 2-1. He'd become really well known as a result of his uh, exploits in his first two England games. Is he it fair to say? Is it fair to say that he made Sheffield Wednesday? Um, yes, it is true to say that. There's, there's a quote where people. someone says that without without Spikes Lee, yeah. Wednesday Andrew weren't weren't that. up to much. Um, yeah, two hundred and ninety three yeah. appearances for Wednesday, eighteen ninety two, nineteen oh three, hundred one yeah. goals in that time. And uh, a league championship, a second division, and then a league championship medal, um, which pretty much took them from non-league um, at the equivalent yes, of the time into in -league. football league champions and made yes. the club. Yes, Ambrose Langley, who was the uh, Sheffield Wednesday captain for a long time, it was him that that made made that that uh, tribute. Yeah. Ambrose Langley could probably be described as an early version of Harry Cripps. I think, okay. Yeah, uh, he, he, he got stuck in. Uh, every player, every team had one of those players up until the and well, until the nineteen seventies, until the nineteen nineties, in a way, in the advent of Premier League, most teams had such such a player. It would have been an interesting competition between the pair. Of them, to, to, um, be, to be fair, another thing so, that yeah, struck like, me. Sorry, sorry, Mark. Another thing that struck me. I mean, as as with many working class men of of, of the time. I mean. Um, Fred was five foot seven, uh, just ten stone. It, that, that's it's quite slight, isn't it? Is it? it you oh, know, he got kicked. A, he got kicked, and he got kicked to high heaven. Yeah, he got kicked. He got kicked to bits. There's no and he, and and that ultimately resulted in him not continuing to play first class football yeah. uh, past nineteen hundred and three when he was thirty three. He would have gone on to do what John Goodall did, which is to play in his forties and Billy Meredith. A little bit, uh, a bit later than that. In, in fact, into his late four. It's no question about that. He was fit. He was unstoppable. Uh, he's one of the quickest footballers ever to have played uh, for England. His speed down the touchline certainly left Princess Mary, who became the queen, <laughs> when he scored three goals for England against Scotland, and she attempted uh, probably um, badly, to be fair. Uh, to chase him down the touchline as he scored the three against Scotland in 1893, waving her handkerchief and shouting, "Come on, Fred!" I think uh, I think course, women course, women chasing him would be a problem all of his life for him. <laughs> well, there was certainly that. There's, there's no, I can't comment. On that <laughs> we, we don't, we, we'll leave it there. Yeah. <laughs> but he, but he, he as he he did later on, of course, uh, suffer quite a torturous. A series of court appearances yeah. uh, because he went bankrupt. He was a massive gambler on the horses and also he had a pretty, um, uh, let's say it was his colourful, uh, colourful life. were uh, graphically <coughs> yeah. revealed in uh, court <laughs> when he was divorced. Uh, yeah. He did, uh, he had an affair when he was in America, when he was working in the munitions factories during the war and then went back uh, to, to manage a number of teams and do successfully off the pitch. He later married a uh, German woman who was 20 years younger than him and they lived uh, remarkably uh, in, in London during the Blitz wow. in the Second World War 
I suspect uh, his wife, Rosa, uh, must have kept herself fairly to herself. Kept her head they, down, they, I they think. Do yeah. it. yeah. It's unfortunate it's not one of the people, it's not one of the um, sort of, we haven't got a lot in the book on that. We're not entirely sure, but I suspect that's because firstly, Fred was an, an elderly man by then. Mm -hmm. And probably quite rightly, they didn't probably go out on the town. No, uh, no, during, no. During that particular particular period just for the, the listeners um you know quite a bit about london actually uh, in, in the book uh, obviously spikes these two greatest games well he had three great games one of them was at celtic park in 1898 the uh, the time when he scored the three against scotland that was in london that was mm. down in richmond obviously um the crystal palace is where he scored his two goals in 1896 against Wolves to win win the cup, and there's a there's a, he also became uh, manager of, of Watford in 1905 or six. He played for Watford. Sorry, he did he did successful for them. He helped to prevent them finishing uh, bottom of the Southern League Division One. And there's the period where we talk about where he went to become uh, the in charge at the uh, at Southern United. Which, right. whose ground was at Nunhead, was in Nunhead, not okay. far at all from um, where from New Cross. Now. Yeah, fact, absolutely. In fact, I mean, the, situ the situation was that uh, supporters would have, in fact, got off. It's called Brown's Field. I don't know if you know it at all. It's just up the hill from Nunhead Railway Station. Right. And okay. there was an attempt by uh, some... Actually, they didn't have a great deal of money to set up a club, Southern United, which was unsuccessful. At the time, of course, uh, Millwall weren't playing. Right yeah. after that was, was Crystal Palace, right. um, which was formed in 1905. And here, I, I'm, I want to take just a little as an aside. Uh, people may be aware that the current ownership of Crystal Palace have attempted to uh, put out, and they've spent a fair bit of money on this, <laughs> that they're their oldest uh, league club uh, in the world, okay, formed yeah. in 1861, and that there's somehow some sorts of links between that club and the current I, I think we need to put that to rest, Mark. That little, well, that, 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 to, to, to be fair, <laughs> it was myself and Clive Nicholson who yeah. largely did put this to rest because when we saw this uh, claim, we decided we would respond in length, and we we uh, did a 128-page submission. You can find it on the spikesleep.com uh, website, which which we basically accused the Eagles of becoming uh, chickens by being unwilling <laughs> to respond uh, to our request to uh, disprove what we what we had to say. There was also a book put out by Stuart Hibbert at the same time, about that very first club. And you'll possibly be aware that the uh, one of the leading lights in the uh, Holmesdale Road uh, uh, fan group has also put out a book just recently on that very first club. And he says that there is he can find no link between that club and yeah. the current club. Now, the FA last year had to update its website because it still had Palace playing in the championship. And in updating that, they reconfirmed that as far as they were concerned, there was no connection and there is no connection between the 1861 to 1875 side and the side that was found, founded in 1905. Yeah. So what, anyway, Fred went down there. Unfortunately, Southern United wasn't successful uh, he then went on to do some scouting for Chelsea. So there's quite a bit about London. There's also stuff about how Spikes. He was adored by Arsenal fans who, on seeing him, nicknamed him the wind. So quickly could he run both for Gainsborough and for uh, she Sheffield, Sheffield Wednesday. So he was he was a very popular uh, man playing playing football, and which is why ultimately. When uh, the uh, the football sketch was set up, which uh, which which Charlie Chaplin actually yeah. appeared in, yeah, the uh, he was asked to appear in the very first shows 
about the football about the football. This was post sketch. post career. He did yes. come come out of the well, game he was injured for money because he was bust. He was, and he, he finished up working for um, Fred Carno, which was he yes, was like he a comedy comedy Fred circus Fred. impresario, really. Mark, yes, Fred Carno, the man who invented the custard pie <laughs> joke uh, and became <laughs> an extremely rich and wealthy individual. The man who put Charlie Chaplin on the road to stardom. Spike Lee and Chaplin appeared on the stage on numerous occasions. Obviously, uh, Chaplin went on to greater things yeah, of course. Uh, on, the, on the stage and, you know, was one of the all-time greats in any field. Uh, yeah. But the fact that Spike Lee was regarded as the man that could bring in the crowds to watch the football sketch, not the on only person, uh, tells you that how popular he was, how his name was, how his name, na name, name was known. Pre presumably ball juggling and comic... Comic, yes. comic slapstick comedy based around football in a yes, kind of a circus setting. Yeah. Tricks, the crowd cheered. <laughs> uh, he, he would have been, without doubt, in his element. Spikes, he loved the big games. It's when and he the was crowds. at his absolute yeah. best. He loved to be a peer. He loved to be a, a star man. He loved to be, you know, the leading light in events. At the same time, it has to be said, uh, when you've read stuff, by other players talking about Spikes Lee, he did take to heart uh, earlier advice to that the game was a team game. To pass the ball was uh, important, and uh, and he was regarded as a very good team player, somebody who would seek out a pass. At the same time, he was very good at putting the ball um, in the back of the net. <laughs> One of his, um, I mean, one of the criticisms, I suppose, he would have made of the English game, and we've, we've mentioned Herbert Chapman, but I think he, he made comments more widely that he he advocated what we would now call fairly modern ideas, Mark, of passing and movement, rather than your traditional hoof it forwards and get it to the big man style of play that English football's been built on. He was quite, I mean, he, it's, he, it was forward thinking, wasn't he, in that way? I mean, it, it, in the times that Spikes Lee played, it wasn't about hitting the big man. Uh, it was about getting the ball to the wingers, getting beyond the defence and pulling the ball back. Okay, right. There weren't like the centre-forwards of his era, for example, uh, Wilson, who he played with when they won the league in 03. He was not a big, big centre-forward. The, the ball in the air very often came about as a came about to a large extent not entirely i wouldn't say this when they changed the rules from the three man offside to a two man yeah. offside 1920s i think was it 1925 and yeah. that, the yeah. reasons behind that were because fewer goals were being scored right uh, in particular newcastle and notts county the two magpies we could say they were thieving the game by developing a very strong uh, offside trap. So they would be... Um, I think I think there's one period where Notts County and Newcastle play five consecutive nil-nil fixtures. That would have been so a ripper, wouldn't it? Eh? <laughs> what sort of suggests the games shouldn't really have started, really. They might as well have just saved yeah. themselves the trouble of travelling <laughs> up and down the country to play one another. But the two full backs had had perfected the the, 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 the the tricks of catching people offside. And so they changed the rules down to two, two things. And before then, perhaps the most skillful player in the side would have been the centre half. And the centre half didn't nece wasn't necessarily big. So for example, John Holt, who played for the Everton in the eighteen nineties. He was a wee dot. I mean, he's five foot five. So yeah. they weren't up against big centre forwards. John Southworth, for example, was a great centre forward for the Blackburn Rovers, and he wasn't. A, it wasn't a thing. The two Johnny Campbells, the Sunderland one, the Aston Villa one in the in the eighteen nineties, they weren't big centre forwards. Wilson wasn't a big centre. Right. Okay. Wasn't a big centre forward. The aim was to get it to things, or was to. You know, put it beyond the two full backs for players to run into, into, into those those spaces behind them. It was particularly 
what happened is, and this is where this is where Spikesy was critical of Herbert Chapman. What Chapman did is he dropped the centre half from being a, a play a playmaker. Right. Um, there were some defensive centre halves. Tom Crawshaw, at Sheffield Wednesday, he was a defensive centre half. Also scored a lot of goals. So he dropped the centre half back. So you got what was called the traditional, you know, the WW formation, your two yeah. full backs, yeah. your yeah. two half backs, which push forward a little bit, your inside forwards which drop which drop back. And Spikes in particular was critical that also the inside forwards dropped back. So the game became a more defensive shape. And that's why Spike Steen was critical of Herbert Chapman. He'd said he'd taken away the skills of the inside forwards. And, of course, the, the greatest header of the ball uh, at that period of time, probably not necessarily matched again until Alan Shearer came along in terms of in front of goal, was, of course, uh, Dixie Dane. And he's, you know, he's unbelievable amount of goals that he scored. Uh, for for Everton, he's you know his record total in sixty, which will never, of course, be hopefully never, no. of course, be matched no. again. Uh, you never know the the gaps between the teams at the top and those even halfway down the Premier League might well mean at some point Manchester City or some other team might have a a goal average of plus seventy or eighty. The the gaps are becoming those teams. I mean, Spikesley, I mean, there's some remarkable, I think it's the Pathé footage that you've mentioned, Mark, on, on yeah. the, the BBC, BBC website. There's a story on there, listeners. I mean, the to, to the modern eye, some of it looks fairly basic. Two lines of, 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 of post, small posts passing in between. But there's there's a remarkable bit where he's, he's demonstrating the technique for a back heel, which again is to some extent now seen as a regular part of, of, of the game. But back then it was revolutionary. This was flair yes. beyond, beyond the... Um, the English mentality of the day, wasn't that, it? That's that's true. If you watch some of the uh, coverage at the time of uh, the FA's coaching schools, it's it's archaic even compared to those eighty four seconds of what Spikes yeah. Lee is doing. Yeah. And yeah. as I said in the in the paperback book which we've put out because uh, the hardback sold out ages ago, uh, we were able to put down about the time and his period in Spain with Badalona in the early 1930s, which showed how revolutionary he'd become. He'd seen, and he'd also clearly seen with the uh, footage that he could take to a larger audience how to play the game, the skills, yeah. the ideas, the entertainment, the enjoyment. And it wasn't just about running up and down and keeping fit, okay? It was also about introducing something which would mean that the, the, the training day that the players enjoyed a greater variety in what they were doing at work, okay? So that people learned skills at the same time, okay? They were just doing something different, making sure that the working day for footballers was more entertaining. They learned the skills whilst having having some Some, some ability to that, express that themselves. Impo that's yeah. important yeah. For, it, for, for anybody. So, you know, Spikes, you... And he was able to do that because he himself was an entertainer. He understood that, yes, people wanted their teams to win, particularly increasingly that's the case. But they also, for, we, as fans, we want to go along. We remember the goal scorers. We remember the players with their additional skill, don't we? We want to be entertained. We want to uh, come out of work after a week and go along and see some good football, some good players, and, and and the do so, uh, you know we, that that's that's the joy of football, isn't it? It's what brings absolutely people people, to, people together, uh, and we all know we also all know that occasionally, limited if our skills might be, we may well score a great goal ourselves playing a game of football, and we'll be able to make comparisons. Spikes Lee understood that, and he was he he was he was more than anything he was an entertainer. I think it's there. I mean, I've seen him, in, in, it may have been a Guardian profile where he's described as, as the outsider for the reason, I think, in English football, Mark. I mean, I think everyone listening to this will recognise there's a mistrust of the entertainer, the outsider, the the, the different. Um, well, I think the other reason why he was an outsider, uh, Nick, was, is because we, we know what addicts are like. And Spice yeah. was a gambling addict. Yes, okay. yes, he, yes. He, his, his day, he wanted to be a jockey when he was growing up. His parents blocked that out. 
Um, so he became a footballer. Okay, we know how secretive people are around their addictions, hmm. uh, and he was that. He spent his money gambling. Okay, sometimes he had stacks of money. He had loads of cash. There's a story <laughs> where he had what must have been tens of thousands of pounds towards the end of his life. Okay, there's a story about that. Yeah, and that had gone by the time he died. You know, all of that gambled gone. away. Yeah, he yeah. gambled it away. By it, it, he was also clearly not a happy man in his marriage, and he sought he sought extramarital affairs, which so is also a form things, of addictive behaviour, Mark, isn't yes, it? I mean, yeah, yeah there's, there's a quality things, there. Yeah, yeah, he's he's he has those he has those faults, and at the same time. He didn't train, for example, with Sheffield Wednesday. One of the reasons he didn't train with Sheffield Wednesday still has a resonance today. Heavy levels of pollution. Sheffield was yeah. a city, industrial, industrial town, yeah. city. Yeah, but he he was in his first season. Okay, there was a fear that he wasn't going to be given a contract at the end of his second season. He was starting to look to to play somewhere else, and the reason for that is the club had expected him to die in the first season. <laughs> They'd actually expected him to die because his lungs were so poor, okay, packed with pollution. Yeah. The, the doctor who'd done the tests on him in the pre-season had said he hasn't got long to live, okay? Right. So when they came back to see him again at the end of the year, okay, they suddenly discovered he was fit, and he quite rightly used this as an opportunity to negotiate the very first three-year contract. Spikes, he was the first man to have a three-year contract. At the time, it's clubs only gave players a one-year contract. Quite and a modern said, mentality there, Mark. The, the, the player knowing his value and, and using his um, his talent to get what was his due because the, yes, the market yes. commanded that, didn't it? Yes. So, you so know. He, said, he said, I also want to go and live to get away from this pollution, I also want to go to live in Gainsborough. Yeah. What he didn't see is he also wanted to go and work in his in his brother's betting shop and <laughs> under the counter betting. They, and he used that as an opportunity to go gambling. He went in his spare time. He went to the race tracks across 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 the north. He lost his apprenticeship because he went he went horse racing. Okay, in an era where the two greatest, well, the greatest thing you could have as a working class lad in that era was to have an apprenticeship. Yeah. If you passed trade, your yeah. apprenticeship, yeah, yeah, you yeah. had a job for life. Okay. Yeah. So this was the greatest. Spikesley, no. Off he wandered to go to Lincoln Racetrack. When he came back, he got sacked. How did he get <laughs> his job back? He happened to play, he happened to play for Games with Trinity. Who was the man that was sponsoring Games with Trinity? The lad who sacked him. Okay, so everybody <laughs> said this lad's going to go and play for one of the bigger teams if you don't keep him. So he offers him his apprenticeship back. Well, how does he repay the guy by offering his apprenticeship back? I mean, he went he went horse racing the following day. Of course, of course. Him. But he kept his job, of course, because he knew at this period of time that's yeah. what he could do. He knew what he was what he was worth. The truth of the matter is the players didn't know what they were worth. Of course, they did try towards the end of the 19th century to set up to set up um, a professional football a association. A players' union, yeah, yeah. yeah. It did. And where that, where, that, where that had an impact is when that didn't prove successful. The clubs in the South, Millwall, Arsenal mm. and, all that, and all of those uh, bigger clubs, of course, they could then attract to the South, professional footballers. So it was that which helped build up the Southern League. Southern League was started in the 18, 1897, yeah, it yeah, was. Yeah. It was started because of uh, because of Millwall. Millwall yeah. were the, 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 the... The leading light, they were, yeah. They were yeah. the leading lights in that. Yeah. Group, okay. Yeah. So the lack, the inability of the clubs in the North to pay and to allow a trade union to be developed. Now, the trade unions, okay were absolutely vital to this period of time because it was the trade unions which in part had fought for and had got holidays, okay? Mm, so yeah. they managed to secure in most of the, uh, many of the 
uh, factories, uh, the shipyards, you'd get a Wednesday afternoon off, okay? The Wednesday afternoon was when the football clubs attempted to play their games. It didn't always work out. And mm. they also, the fans got Saturdays, Saturday afternoons off, okay? So those were the times when it was as a result of collective bargaining, collective organisation, and the players themselves wanted to be part of that, and they were they were knocked back. They were refused their due rewards. For those who don't know, I mean, I, I do some work for the Professional Footballers Association, and you know, we put up plaques to footballers. Yeah. And and some of them, the wages that those were getting, the likes of Joe Mercer, for example, recently put one up. Bert Wally at Manchester United, Stan Cullis, better when he was getting a manager. But as a player, yeah, you didn't make any serious money as a footballer until until you know the 1960s and even then Manchester United were still paying their players Dennis Law 25 quid average working wage at the time was about 19 pounds a week so the players were being denied what was theirs and Spikesley was one of theirs he was being he's being denied he brought in large crowds of people people turned up to watch Spikesley and to watch his side and yet at the same time large amounts of money was not being it was not. Be- it's the same. The women of it recently, the, cl- the the crowds that women were bringing in during the First World War, was what feared, what and afterwards is what frightened the administrators in the game because the women were giving what was the equivalent of millions of pounds towards the armed services, and what that was showing is that there was money. Football was making large amounts of money. Okay, mm-hmm. where was this money going? Because it certainly wasn't going to the players. We no. know it was, go- we know it was going where to it was the going the, o- the owners and the directors. It and, was going to. Some... It was in in, in that yeah. way. It, it was there was a certainly a strong ele- elements of that. So in the book, we've attempted to to not only explore the football but also the dynamics between the football, and that's why we've used the words working class deliberately mm. yeah. uh, in in the title in it because it's a remarkable achievement to be had but it's also an achievement which is done in a period of time when uh, there was an attempt to uh, nationally and internationally to improve the conditions of, of working class people not just at the football but in general that was the situation so Spikesy was the beneficiary of that and he used that to his 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 advantage and so when it's been said Spikesy isn't known uh, we've turned that around. The, the, the book has turned has turned that around. Increasingly, we've done lots of talks. I mean, we've done talks uh, yeah. for radio stations in America. You can find that on our website. Um, on all different on all different subjects, particularly myself. Uh, obviously, I've written dozens and dozens of books on on clubs prior to the First World War, Manchester United. Uh, Sunderland, Bury, who were a gr- who were a great football team. There's books about all the players before the First World War, and obviously, obviously the Spikes the uh, Spikes the books so, uh, from a remarkable, the- remarkable, remarkable person. I mean, I, 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 having done some research for this this conversation, Mark. I mean, just to to look into his life. There's so many, there's so many bits that you could you could hold a conversation in itself about. I mean, just the mere fact that he didn't accept the at the end of his career, the average working class player's lot was then to go back to the factory, go back to the docks down here, back to the grind, back to where you've come from. Fred didn't do that. Um, he took to the circus, the show, the comedy. He was always looking to raise himself up and away, which in itself, I, I don't know if you'd agree with this, but I think that's a very working class trait, that desire to better yourself by using whatever skills you have. It's, it's it, it runs in us all, I think. I mean, what was happening? What was happening in English football is there was still the the owners were still sticking to the idea that they themselves should have a part to play in picking the team. Okay, yeah. so the managers that were being appointed were versus, were administrators. Okay, Spikesy didn't want that. Okay, he wanted to be in charge of the players. He wanted to pass on the skills that he had. To the, the creative part, him. yeah, and he wanted to yeah. pass that on to yeah. young people, yeah. which is why he did a lot of work with young people towards the end end of his end of his career. So frustrated, I mean, there's the Watford, for example. It was a bit late, bit later on, uh, 
Watford more or less offered Spike Lee uh, the job at the end of the 1909-10 season. But the Sheffield Wednesday, um, Sheffield Wednesday sent a letter saying he'll be a great coach as long as you can keep him out of the racetrack. That's, <laughs> that's that was the letter. <laughs> And, 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 and so they, they put this to him and he basically turned around and he said to him, what I do in my spare time has got nothing to do with you. So modern attitude, yeah. very modern he attitude, said, yeah. He said, yeah. Um, so despite the fact that he was skint, despite the <laughs> fact that he was gambling too much money, he still had enough to say, well, I'm still worth what I'm worth. And I'm, if I want to go and gambling, it's my money. It's yeah. now to do It's now to do with you. I'm not tied to you in my... In my spare, in my spare. Yeah, time, yeah, okay? yeah, absolutely. So he, 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 he didn't get the job. Okay, it's just, just what you would, what you would expect. He wouldn't get the job. Okay, so the situation is that uh, he saw greater. He saw the world as his oyster. He'd seen uh, players like Edward Chadwick go off and be managers in in Holland. He'd seen other people uh, go off and start to coach and. For example, Steve Boomer went to coach over at Fred Prentland. They all started to look further afield yeah. where they were to be given the opportunities. Because in a way, the, the continental clubs, they were looking at England still as the great the great nation. The fount of all Scotland. knowledge, yeah. 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 And, yeah. And, and, and so <clears throat> he was happy to go there. He was a, a very, very bright man, uh, Fred Spikesley. So he went, he went to Sweden, okay? He learned Swedish in a matter of weeks. So he'd left school. He'd left school, you know, at an early age. In Gainsborough. You know, yeah, yeah. Formal yeah, education yeah. was quite poor. But yeah. he went there, he learned the language. Okay. I mean he did this he did the same Remarkable. Way in Germany. Remarkable. He learned the language. So I'm he, still struggling with a little bit of German, I can tell you that much, yeah, Mark. He went he learned German. <laughs> he went to Spain. He'd already learned, of course, he'd already learned Spanish because he'd gone he gone to Mexico. So yeah. he, he not only had he learned these skills, uh, the footballing skills, but he 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 gone with a spirit of adventure, with a drive and a determination to find out more about the countries and to learn the language so he could pass on the skills. This is a this is a man of, of remarkable talents of, of and depth uh, and depth. There's a there's a there's a, a fantastic quote. I'm going to paraphrase it slightly. I've got it to hand. But <laughs> um, when he when he won the Swedish league title with AIK Stockholm. Um, he made remarks to say how um, he sees the Continentals with their willingness to apply to learn technique, ball control and technique, that in 20 years' time, and this would have been, what well, I guess, in the, in the 1920s, in 20 years' time, as he saw it, they would overtake England and um, be the superior, superior sides. And lo and behold, um, <laughs> he, he had foresight there, Mark, didn't he? He saw the way it was going to go. He did. With... He, he did. He did. He did. He... He and others, the likes of Jimmy Horgan, for example, who's best known, they understood that on the continent, the sites were improving on a regular basis. And there was plenty of indications of that uh, throughout the 1920s. The best players, Steve Bloomer was a great superstar, okay? The, the two superstars, as you would say, football-wise, yeah, prior yeah. to First World War, were Bloomer and Billy Meredith, those those were the two great superstars of the game. Spikesy drops just below them in a way. Um, they played. They, you know, Bloomer went and went. Bloomer was Bloomer was locked up during uh, the, the first world war. He, was, he spent time in Rulapen. Well, that's a remark. Yeah. I thought we might I thought we might close with that story because that's quite a remarkable stories. Times of POW in the first world war, yeah, isn't well, it? Rulapen has some good books out uh, as well. Uh, uh, Paul Brown's book about Rollerpun's certainly worth worth the read. It's only a tenner. Uh, yeah. They, uh, yeah, a lot of lot of. It sounds remarkable, but we now know, despite the fact that the First World War was coming, many people didn't know and didn't really believe it would arrive. We'll come to was, that. When it yeah, arrived, yeah, there were yeah. lots of English coaches in Germany, and Bloomer was one of them. And what happened was, everybody. There was a rumor went around, which was, it was which was misplaced in Germany, which is that all German citizens had been incarcerated, mm. and so a decision was taken to incarcerate uh, all of the British citizens, including uh, in Spikesley. Yeah, the very first time ever in warfare that citizens 
uh, were uh, who were not involved in the con conflict, who were incarcerated. It's then when Spike Lee is him and his him and his son are, are arrested. They perform Spike Lee performs a little trick and he manages to be allowed to go home, pretended he was unwell, he wasn't fit. Uh, Bloomer was unable to 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 come up with something as as good as that. But I mean, the truth of the matter was, Spike Lee did have a dodgy leg by then. Well, the little trick, which 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 is which, which, the little trick, is he managed to dislocate his own knee, didn't he? To yes, to well, convince a, a doctor he wasn't fit for uh, for, for yes. military service, he which allowed him boiling hot water down his leg <laughs> for a couple of hours, and he managed to get get one. Anyway, Bloomer and the rest of them got sent to Rulapun, where it was uh, they were very much left on their own to to run the camp, and there were some great games, and it became a like a a, a place where. Footballers in close proximity to one another uh, develop new skills, new techniques, new means and methods of playing the game. So it was it was a, a great experiment. I'm sure it's one they would have preferred not to have engaged in, but nevertheless, it yeah. was a microcosm of how to play the game. He made and, use and of his time. He went on to coach, uh, yeah. particularly in Spain uh, after the war. And as I said, uh, Spike Lee, who escaped that, he he he. he went back to Germany eventually after going to America and Spain and, well, all over the world, to, to be fair. We know he went to Peru as well, uh, Spike Lee. We don't know exactly uh, what uh, he was up to, uh, but we do know he went he, he went. He went to Peru. So, yeah, he was a man who wanted to get out and about. Uh, like and certainly did that. <laughs> I mean, I, I also just reading, I mean, in, in addition to all of that, listeners, he was also a prize-winning prize runner over 440 yards and an oarsman of some note and a pianist, Mark, as well, apparently, he could play the piano. Yes, he was a good pianist. <laughs> as if all that wasn't runner. enough. <laughs> he was a phenomenal runner. There's no question about that. And it's, he would have, whether he would have gone on to run in the Olympics, uh, is it could be, there's a strong case to suggest he was good enough. Of course, he wasn't allowed to because he was a professional sportsman. Yeah, amateur, so, yeah, yeah. But he was beating people who did, who wanted to achieve some? I'm not sure he was as good as as, as Wharton, Arthur Wharton, in terms of the running, uh, but certainly he was unstoppable once he got the ball past the full back. You you, you couldn't you, you couldn't catch him with the speed that spikes spikes the which is why he was called the wind by the Arsenal fans. And uh, you know he was, he was so he was skillful. He scored a lot of goals. Uh, he played out on the left, although he was mainly. Uh, you know, right-footed, so could come inside. A uh, good taker of corners, and uh, not great in the air by any means. He certainly that that would have been uh, yeah. one of his weaker weaker parts. His game, and not a great tackler. He was never expected, or very rarely, he dropped back in the 1896 FA Cup final, and that was regarded as you know he shouldn't really be yeah. doing that in that yeah, yeah. era. Yeah. So he was yeah. a very much a, a lad of a creative the the the, the yes. as as ever as ever in English football Mark it's the creative artists that we yes. must trust the most yes. isn't it? Eh? Um I'll I send mean... you also a link Nick I've got a link to uh, for the for the book as well. There's a sort of code we've got out at the moment for okay. people who want to buy the book. Uh, direct from Penn and yeah do that that would be that great we'll, I'll, we'll I'll certainly send, stick a, that. certainly yeah. stick that on the on the uh, social media when it goes out yeah just to, I'll do, I'll do, I need to sort that out just to close Fred's story he would pass away fittingly some would say in 1948 in a in, in Tattersall's enclosure at Goodwood Racecourse um, in a heat wave a coronary thrombosis overtaking him um, at the age of 78 um, shouldn't be and, forgotten he was running to collect his winnings, <laughs> a winning ticket in his hands <laughs> from his hometown of Gainsborough. So even at the end, even at the end, it was all back to winner in all, all one go, basically. And he didn't collect his, he didn't collect his winnings. I think that's a sort of a fitting tribute. But that's the way, way it should close, it, shouldn't it? Sum, yeah, sum as, a, as a person, speed, uh, a winner, but not quite managing to collect the money which he get it over the line at the same time it has to be said he did manage from the 1930s into the 1940s to manage to earn enough money to travel regularly to watch the racing and to have just <laughs> just enough to do well to stay in a hotel so by the end he might have gone bankrupt before but by the end he was still doing just enough 
to have a de have a de decent living, and he's left his wife a few thousand pounds. Yeah, so it's yeah. Sort of, it's sort of it, it, that one that one too bad. Most of us would feel happy enough with that. I think living in a hotel, being able to go gambling, being able to go horse racing, <laughs> it's not it's not so bad. Is There's it? There's worse really, ways to go, Mark. There's worse um... ways to die, and but he didn't get his money. A remarkable man. It's wonderful to be able to do my little bit via this this podcast to mark the the life of Fred Spikes. A huge thank you to Mark Metcalf once again. Mark, great to have you back on the oh, show, mate. That, to be able to talk about this, this character. And we uh, the book. Um, we'll put a link on on to Mark's book yeah. and and um, do support it. It's great stuff. Many thanks, Mark. Thank you for coming on, mate. All right, and thank cheers. thank you, Fred Spikesley, as well. What, what a life. <laughs> Memories.